Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Literacy View. Um, I am so honored to be here with our very special guests from the Reading League. We have Dr. Maria Murray and Carrie Curdo with us today. And we are going to be looking at the new navigation reports, talking about the navigation reports and seeing how this fits in with their curriculum guidelines today. And there are a lot of different places to look in, and use this material. So we want to be really clear about everything. But first, I want to just um, give you a little bit of background about Dr. Maria Murray. She is the founder of uh, and the CEO and president of the Reading League a pioneer in the science of reading movement. She has been active in this field for more than 20 years. Prior to founding the Reading League, Maria was an associate professor at SUNY Oswego, where she taught courses related to literacy assessment and intervention for 10 years. We have Carrie Curdo with us, and she is the Reading League's National Science of Reading Project Director, and she is also a certified reading specialist. And I believe, Carrie, you are the designer of all of these tools. Am I correct? You, along with, I'm sure, a team of people. But uh, you Yes, absolutely. It's a team effort. I think the the history of getting to where we are now has been a, a huge team effort that began before I even joined the Reading League. But um, this project in particular is one that I have managed. Great, great. So we're so happy to have you both with us today. And there are a lot of questions and a lot of um, ideas. So we're, we're packed right now with so many thoughts. But let me kick off. Um, one thing that I noticed when I was looking through the guidelines, and that's what people are going to be using along with the workbook to um, understand how to navigate through any program, correct, to see if it is aligned with the science of reading. And that's what you have used in order to judge a program from your end. So I just want to be clear. That is correct. Cool. All right. The so one thing I noticed was that, um, you know, in looking through this, you had non-negotiables about each area of reading along with assessments. I'd like to start there with the non-negotiables because to me that is really so important for people to understand. So um, it doesn't matter to me who we start with, Maria, Carrie, decide <laughs> um, who would like to jump in and start there with the non-negotiables. Carrie, you want to start? I always do this to her, but it is her project. <laughs> and I and I want to support her amazing work. I'm so proud of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we were both around when the original version of this uh, was being drafted by a group of experts, I think a couple of years ago. Um, and we'd be happy to kind of tell you that whole story at some point, too. But, you know, in in our discussion and in our pouring through the research, there were some things that just had more of a consensus about Um we want to name that there is no perfect curriculum. And if I had a dollar that I said that every time this past year, I golly, I'd be rich. Um, there's no perfect curriculum. There are certain things that we want to look for. And there's certain things that we want to avoid. So one strength of the curriculum evaluation guidelines is that we help folks uplift those practices that are counter to the science of reading, that are counter to research, that may develop skills that poor readers use, um, or it may waste instructional time, which is so precious. Um, and there are some that are more important than others. So um, for example, in language comprehension, um, we want to make sure that we, um, I'm trying to find my non-negotiables here, um, that we 
don't just work using implicit student choice, right? We want to make sure that our content that we're teaching is rich and robust. We want to make sure that students are exposed to rich vocabulary. So that's a non-negotiable. If you have a curriculum and go you're going through your entire day without exposing kids to rich vocabulary and complex syntax, then when they get to those higher level books, hopefully sooner rather than later, uh, then they're not going to be able to comprehend well, right? Um, if writing is not taught or if it's taught separately from all times, that's another huge red flag, right? Writing is such an important vehicle for comprehension, and we want to make sure that it's integrated and used wisely and widely. So um, those really important practices are the ones that we uplift as major red flags to look for in our non-negotiable section. I think you're muted, Faith. Time. I do this all the time. I mute myself. I forget you too, Maria. And then I forget. <laughs> Faith, there's that, we're actually having one issue right now. For some reason, it's not showing live on our Facebook group. So a lot of people are messaging us. They can't get on. So I just put into the Facebook group to hop on High Five Literacy. But I'm just going to let you know. Um, for some reason, it's not showing on our Facebook group right now. I don't know what happened, why it's not. Let me try again. It should be, but it's a glitch. Facebook group. So it's on my high five page. Lauren Taylor just said it's on my page, but it should also be in the Facebook group. I'm seeing, it looks like an exclamation point in the I group. know, it's some so, kind of technical difficulty. Hmm, well, I don't know if you could um, switch over. Are you do able you wanna, to? Do you want to quickly start over? Um, well, I don't want to lose people either. Um, you know, maybe just uh, we have to just tell people to go into a high five group. Could you put a message into the uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll keep doing that. Yep. I'll work on tech issues. Interesting. Oh, somebody said I'm seeing it. Hold on. I'm going to try again now. Missy, Missy just said that she's seeing it. Are you seeing it, Missy, in the Literacy View Facebook group? It was also working well on Twitter, Lauren just said. So it's on Twitter, but it's not in, I don't see it in our Facebook group. It's not up here at the top. It's okay. I'll work on the tech issues, Faith. Okay, I'll, I'll continue. Okay. So, all right, um, Maria, so we were just talking about non-negotiables. Let's kind of start from the beginning because obviously this is something that's been um, in progress for a while. So why don't we start <laughs> from the very beginning in terms of how you decided, <laughs> yeah, let's start from the beginning and let's decide how um, this came about when you started working on this and the, you know, the different iterations that came <laughs> from the beginning, if you could talk about that. Wait, just, just some good news. I got it to work. I fixed it. Oh, awesome. yay. very good. Excellent. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much. You're okay. a lifesaver. Okay, Thank you. go ahead. Let's go back just a smidgen to the defining guide. Mm -hmm. So that came out after 14 months of work, <laughs> um, weekly meetings, um, and finally um, be turned into a tiny tangible book or a free download in 2022. So that already putting us starting this project probably in oh 2020 or a little earlier than that. I remember the idea for suggesting that we try to clarify what this this thing called the science of reading is was in fall of summer or fall of 2019, I want to say. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Um, but suffice it to say we were already seeing back then, and I can't believe how long ago that seems, um, a lot of misuse misapplication, you know, you, you saw it on social media, you know, and, and totally understandable, right? No one's 
bad or wrong, you know, horrible for doing that. But, you know, oh, we tried the science of reading or we're doing the science of reading. The science of reading is a body of research. You can't, Carrie said it well the other day. And I'm like, oh, genius. Um, just sub substitute in for the science of reading the words body of knowledge and see if it makes sense. So you can't say we're doing the body of knowledge or something. It doesn't make sense. Um, but we can say we're trying to transition to practices that are more aligned with this body of knowledge, the science of reading, or we're starting to abandon some practices that are not aligned with this body of knowledge, science of reading. Anyway, so we really wanted to highlight that's what this really is. And if you don't understand or appreciate that there even is a body of knowledge that's so vast and came from different disciplines and different countries and different languages over different decades, um, you might not really have a good appreciation of its potential. And you and I have talked about this faith, you know, we've come, we've been at this a long time and it's promise to really help all children um, become as good a reader as they can. Um, so the, the Reading League's mission in general is to advance the understanding or no, <laughs> advance the um, awareness that there's an evidence base. So this really underpins our mission, just this, this project alone. Um, then once you get a bunch of bright minds in, in a room, as you know, um, your intention of just starting out, coming out with a definition can just go all over. Well, we also have to tell people what the science of reading is not. We also have to tell people, you know, some of the major findings and, and practices that are aligned and aren't, and, and then some calls to action and even more. So that's why this book became a, a pretty imp impressive project. Um, for us. And um, then, <laughs> and no good deed goes unpunished, uh, <laughs> you start also around the same time seeing um, some programs come out that are doing just what we hoped would never happen. People, you know, and this is just how life is in the world of education. Um, slapping stickers on things and, and, you know, you're like, oh my gosh, it's scary. All the money and the time and the hope that are wasted. So <clears throat> another group of people was assembled and this, you know, now Carrie's kind of with us and well, you were also with the defining guide, Carrie, I don't want to cut you short, but the curriculum evaluation guidelines started out as the curriculum evaluation tool just like a smaller version. Um, we, we wanted to identify red flags. Like if you see this in a program, you know, you know, they maybe look around a little more. And then we also put um, green flags <laughs> in the earlier version. And, and that was a little bit clunky. It didn't work out great. So we went back to the drawing board and um, to give people in this, listening arena, a break from my voice. I'll pass it back to you, Carrie. You can take us down the timeline a little bit. And I really appreciate you allowing us to explain the timeline because I want people to really understand what is what. Yeah. And the why too, right? I'm sure that mm -hmm. a lot of folks that are listening in right now have had that question of, do my materials align to the science of reading? And if you talk to any publisher, no matter who they are, knowing that this phrase is popular, their answer is going to be, well, yes, of course. <laughs> um, and so I was volunteering on the committees for the Defining Guide and the Curriculum Evaluation Guidelines while I was working at the Rhode Island Department of Education, and we had passed a high quality curriculum bill. And our approved list was the All Green on Ed Reports. And um, as I started looking through some of the instructional materials, um, I was uh, surprised. Uh, to find some practices that were definitely red flag practices in these curricula that were approved in my state. And so um, 
uh, raising some of those concerns, as again, I'm sure that many folks on this call have uh, noticed and raised those concerns. Um, and so I was really grateful that the Reading League was uh, initiating this project. So when I came on board about a little over two years ago is when we started pulling that tool apart, because from a usability standpoint, they weren't the red flags and green flags weren't exact opposites. And so it was hard to say, well, yeah, it definitely has this and it doesn't have this, but is this that and is that this? And so that's what Maria means by clunky. It was clunky. It was it was challenging to use, helpful, but challenging to use. So we pulled it apart. We really focus it on the red flags uh, because, again, there's no resource that that does this. And the other thing that is really beneficial about this particular resource um, is that if you go to the second half, really, of the resource, you can see pages and pages and pages of the empirical research that we are drawing this knowledge from. So when I came on board, we also hired a consultant, Dr. Doreen Maisie, who is amazing, amazing Dr. Maisie. Uh, and she read through almost all of the research to make sure that the words on the page really were taken from the research, um, from these meta-analyses, so that we could have a valid resource that the public can know comes directly from the research. There's no bias, no interference from publishers, um, no opinion. It's coming from the research. So that's the other benefit, right? Yes. And so I just want to stop for a second yeah. because, Judy, I think we need a cheers button for this because that is so evident in looking at the work that you put in. It's so clear to me, and as Maria said, I've been at this a long time. I could tell when something is done very well with a lot of work and careful details. I mean, it, it's really a masterpiece. So cheers. You know, I've been getting the chills the whole time because this is so needed at this time. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. And Judy, you were saying how excited you were. Those people who are just coming on, uh, we thank you for being patient. We apologize um, that it didn't show up in the Facebook group right away. So just quickly for those people um, who kind of were confused and jumped on late, I am Faith Borkowski. My co-host is Judy Boxner. We're here with the Reading League, Dr. Maria Murray and Carrie Curdo. We are going through um, the navigation reports that they are going to be coming out with May 1st. And we are talking about how the guidelines in the workbook fit in to being able to analyze really any program. And I use program specifically as a different term from curriculum because what they have, ladies and gentlemen, is curriculum. What publishers sell you is a program. I wanna just be very, very clear that program has to follow a curriculum, but that doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect. You have to be able to know what your curriculum is. So Judy, wanna jump to you now. You were so excited and you said, do you think I can ask this? And I'm like, of course you should. Go ahead, ask what you want. <laughs> all right, so first of all, the excitement from our viewers today online, the chatter is so enthusiastic. People are so excited to have you here, Maria and Carrie. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have over 168 people on just one platform. The numbers keep growing and there's just, everybody's cheering along. We are so excited and honored to have you here today. It's just really such a treat. Usually I'm not a night person. All of a sudden I feel like I'm on fire. After I read this, <laughs> this I was just like, wow, I gotta wake up. I gotta, I gotta have a good time with these ladies. So um, I think you guys might have covered this early on in the discussion, but I was thinking, so I see like you have a lot of the the guidance with the one, two, what was it? Let me see. I think it was like right. And there was a one, a two, a three, and a four, right? So A, I thought that was really interesting because even in dating, we're always looking for red flags. So that term in general really was an interesting one. And it was kind of 
you know, red flags. What do we think of when there's red flags? It's something that's probably not the best for us, right? Or for our students. So my question to you guys, and I think you might have covered it, is how come you guys did um, a lot of the red flags, what not to do, rather than like a checklist of what we should do? Just because I'm going to, you know, it's going to take time for me to learn how to use this tool, um, how to bring it to my school and into the districts that I work in and so forth. Maria, you want to take this one? You're muted, Maria. <laughs> Faith, you and me. I usually, I don't hit record when I'm supposed to hit record. Like, it's just, you know, I, I'm a people person. Uh, but I, I think what we were just finishing talking about was how the first clunky version um, didn't have, it had red flags and green flags, but with this new iterate, you know, the guidelines, I, I'm bringing actual hard copies so people know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> with these, um, and I, and I want to read the part in the directions too, if I can find it, I'm not really prepared, I didn't highlight it, but it tells people how to, you know, there's some directions and it says, um, please prioritize looking for red flags, which are practices not aligned with the body of knowledge, the science of reading. Then you go through each section one at a time, looking for red flags that will tell you that these non-aligned practices are present in the program. So um, we can talk about that. And we did just say the word program faith, right? <laughs> um, if what you're evaluating features a red flag, place an X and blah, 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 blah. And then it says optional. When you finish reviewing a program for red flags and decide that there are not enough red flag components to remove it from consideration, you can opt to continue reviewing it for practices that are evidence aligned. And a lot of that, we felt this was an important, you know, it's a first do no harm. <laughs> If you have a program that has a potentially harmful impact on children's reading, don't consider it. There's other fantastic ones out there. And is there a perfect one out there? Can we all nod no in unison? <laughs> no. Exactly. And is that okay? Yes, that's okay. And there, we have to accept that because we're going to assume that people will build their knowledge and learn how to supplement and, and, um, you know, fix anything, but it's much easier to supplement what's missing than to remove what's there that's that's a problem. So with that being said, I think some of that lays the groundwork for Carrie explaining these, um, what's in the workbook that people can download if they're using this on their own. Oops, I'm yeah, too fast. definitely. And there are the flag numbers. I'll kind of hold that up while you talk a little, Carrie. I, I hope like you they brought up the the do no harm. That was um, something that was said a lot last week at the Black Literacy Matters conference. Yeah. That was excellent. Um, so one thing that has become evident in this this actual review process of this past year that's ending with the birth of these navigation reports on May first um, is that a lot of these tier one curricula. Are, are huge, they're bloated, right? Um, uh, there's a lot, right? They want to check all of those aligned practices boxes so they have the add-ons. Um, so if we were to review for those, it's likely that we'd find them. Um, however, they may also include these red flag practices that teachers may not be looking for. And that's really the part where you can cut the fluff and teach the stuff, as Anita Archer says. <laughs> so we're hopeful that that's really helpful. And, and Judy, I'm glad that you brought up the numbering system because that happened um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, because Matt Burns did an iterator reliability study um, and he is a numbers guy. I am not, I'm scared of numbers, but he loves numbers and he needed um, some numbers to go along with it. Uh, but also because it's not really possible to just check yes or no for these red flags. Um, I will tell you that um, we have had, we had um, a few curricula that declined to provide us materials. Um, we had several curricula that did allow us to review them. And I want to just herald all of them and say thank you very much for allowing us to, to look through your materials and create these reports because it's yeah. it's a lot for publishers to allow us to do that. Um, and, and there are not that many fours 
um, in the reports that we are going to um, be posting, right? There's not a lot of practices that are like, whoa, this is a huge red flag. Um, but there are some instances where the program may have room to grow, or this may be a part where a school says, okay, the program is strong in these areas, but we need to kind of attend to these areas. So truly they are intended to be informational. And um, and the purpose is, I noticed one of our, our viewers said that you need a lot of background knowledge to be able to use the curriculum evaluation tool, uh, sorry, the curriculum evaluation guidelines. And it's so true. We did a pilot study and listening in to these conversations was like really excited. I was kind of like Judy getting all excited um, and energized because this is like real nerdy talk. Um, but <laughs> you can only like dive in and enjoy that if you are in the like word nerd fan club. Um, you have to have some knowledge. So we decided that that um, it would be beneficial, hopefully, for the field for us to engage in these reviews in a very thoughtful and method methodological methodical methodical process so that this will be another one of the reading league's resources that will be reliable and valid perfect so you know Wait, we have a couple of things in the chat if i could just uh, no why don't we leave it for the end only because okay, might be we, we might problem. answer some of those questions as we go and then yep so you guys can keep putting stuff in the chat and we will definitely have time where we review the 100 percent. we'll do it at the end so i think one thing you said carrie maria how bloated um these programs can be mm -hmm. and then teachers are left to have to sort through this so one thing I learned when I was in reading first was um, all about fidelity to the core. <laughs> and that was a term, fidelity to the core. And so how are teachers supposed to use a program with fidelity if it's bloated? Now, Molly Ness talked about on one of our episodes, yeah. feasibility as opposed mm -hmm. to fidelity. And so is it reasonable to be able to really do this? Could any teacher really do this? Do we need somebody at the school leading the way? Do we need a coach that pulls it together? Could you maybe talk about fidelity with any of these programs? Here goes the F-bomb. <laughs> I thought that was fluency. <laughs> now it's for okay. okay well um i'm gonna go to i'm gonna do a little bit of an answer to your question and go back again to the directions because we knew this was a heavy lift and that people we you know we heard you know um that some schools were just sending the guidelines to publishers and saying, could you fill them out for us so we could <laughs> um, know whether your program's aligned or not? And we don't want to do that, right, everyone? But um, we say assemble a team that has a base of knowledge in the science of reading, hyperlinked to the defining guide so they know what that is. It's important to include school, district leaders, educators, special educators, and specialists who've been trained and understand the terms within the glossaries. So, um, and I'll just pause there and let Carrie go from that point. But we know, we understand, and then we learned truly how hard of a lift it is. And that led to the next part of this project. Yeah. And I think what you're asking is fidelity to teaching the tier one program. Um, let's say that my program is called uh, reading is the best, right? And so then you have the reading is the best team coming in and telling you how to teach the program and ensuring that you're doing everything with fidelity. But what Maria lifts up is important because um, there are a lot of states that are passing high quality curriculum legislation. There's a lot of states that are passing, um, you know, PD in reading research legislation. Um, and some of the conversations that I've been privy to in state departments of education is that it is more helpful when folks build their knowledge in the reading research first, and then they can use that to understand where, um, you know, where they may need to pivot a bit, right? Um, 
And I'm sure that there are probably publishers that are really like, no, no, Fidelity, what is she talking about? Okay. And what if your fidelity is to a practice that is not aligned to the research and that's going to waste time? So, um, so yes, highly trained coaches are worth five times their weight in gold. Um, they are the secret sauce to success, I think, in, in bridging that gap from knowledge to practice. Um, states that have had the most success have included funding for those state coaches that can make that leap and help educators through that journey. So it is it is absolutely essential um, in success to have highly trained folks there to help understand the data, help understand um, where the program is working, where it may not be. And we're hoping that these tools are a great resource for those coaches and for other staff members, uh, educators, administrators who may not have the base of knowledge that can read through these and say, all right, so, you know, we've done our first year with Fidelity and now we're ready to look at what worked, what didn't, and we can look at alignment to the evidence um, and determine our next steps. All right. Well, from what I'm hearing you say, teacher knowledge comes first. Is that correct? Okay. I think that is important. Always. 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 Okay. Knowledge construction before yes, instruction. That's a lot of BS that I'm hearing. So no, I'm giving the cheers button. Are you doing the cheers button? I'm doing BS because from what I'm hearing, there's a lot of BS talk that teacher knowledge comes after the program. And so, no, we, we have to know how to choose the program. So we need yes. teacher knowledge. So BS to anybody. Yes. And the Reading League has always said, this is, this is one of our soapboxes, and we are very adamant in saying teacher knowledge first and foremost. That's why we exist. Exactly. You know, again, we've been at this a long time. Exactly. And others exactly. in this room and here. And yes. we have seen how many adoptions, even when they adopt a pretty darn good program, it flumps because, it's, you know, the practice. You know, we yeah. don't even need to talk in about my it. State, we have, you know, cities that have adopted programs that purported to align to the science. And then years later, the kids still aren't reading and they mm -hmm. have to adopt supplementary materials after they spent millions of dollars. So um, if if folks had the knowledge of what to look for and what to look out for, then, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I would say that that's it's highly likely that that could have been avoided. So yeah. Judala. I want, <laughs> so you talk about tasks in these programs, right? Always talking about um, tasks. It doesn't matter which program. Um, and you had said some of these are impossible for first grade, kindergarten. Why don't you talk about what you've been seeing as far as tasks that are included in these programs? So in the field and with my private clients at work, through my colleagues, there's a lot going out there right now. So a lot of these programs, not only one, many of the programs out there, whether it be HMH or Expeditionary Learning or Wit and Wisdom, there is a lot going on and there's a lot of things being asked of students and there's a lot of tasks. And how do we as teachers still in the field who have some kids that, you know, maybe haven't cracked the code and now they're asked to find text evidence and details and, and not only verbalize it, but also write it on a graphic organizer. I mean, I'm not confident that every task in all these programs has been, you know, reviewed with evidence. So how do we figure out, you know, what task is okay what's developmentally appropriate and backed in, you know, <clears throat> evidence. Like, how do we navigate through it? Because in the field, I see a lot of kids struggling to complete tasks. And I think the goal of tasks with whatever program or curriculum that you're using is for kids to get closer to that stage of independence. How can we get them close to that stage of independence? But I also think that something that needs to be looked at is what did children produce after they were shown how to do something yeah i do the we do and you do could they do it on their own and what does that mean and look like 
and have, you know, these programs really aligned all their tasks to, to evidence. Yes. And I, before you answer, I just want to piggyback on what Judy said, because I think this is so important. You know, I think the programs are being sold, like you said, Maria, with this SOR label, this like it's approved. But, you know, does that mean everything in the program has evidence behind it? I, You know, we just yeah. said it might not. So could you kind of answer what Judy's saying and maybe talk about how this an evidence aligned program is different from having every task that is evidence-based. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I think you get the idea. Yeah, Carrie's waiting for me to say, go ahead, Carrie. Go ahead. There you go. <laughs> we have this down pat now. <laughs> well, I think she, okay. Um, Did we throw you? <laughs> yeah, I thought Maria was taking this one, so oh, I was. No, no, that's fine. All right, I'll come back in. That's I got you. <laughs> yeah. So there are so many. I mean, if we were to just leaf through, how many? How many points are there in the guidelines? Seventy something. Yeah. So yeah, maybe there's... starting with the non-negotiables, yeah. right? We talked yeah. about that before some folks joined, but those are those are really the ones to 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 focus mm -hmm. on first and foremost. We need kids to learn to decode mm -hmm. and you know, by following explicit and systematic instruction. And we need robust language experiences and writing, right? And those are all um, named in the non-negotiable section. Right. So that could be a first primary roadmap. And then for the optional practices, those that are there, as I think Faith was saying, there are not, all of these aren't going to be, even though there's an evidence base to show that those are, you know, um, effective practices that kids should receive. Um, I think what you're saying is that not all of these may have been, um, we don't have an actual RCT study just on that facet of, in and of itself. Um, and that would be great in a wonderful, perfect world. And maybe someday such a thing will exist that there's a curriculum um, that maybe all curricula can go through, but good luck. I mean, how are you going to even get the funding or the time or the agreement from schools to be randomly assigned to getting this curriculum or not and whatnot? I mean, it's just, it's a heavy, heavy lift to imagine it. Um, so we have to go with, um, instead of based, and everyone uses these terms differently, but here's how I do it. If it's based and the research, that means we can actually go and find out that this was studied, this facet or this entire program. And then aligned is a little bit um, a, a, in a safer place to be because you can say, while we may not be able to, um, I'll just pick one and hope I pick a good one randomly, okay. Um, oh gosh, I hope I do. Uh, instruction includes, oh, that's a red flag. Instruction includes robust teacher-student and student-student conversations in order to support a clear understanding of vocabulary words. Now, can we find an RCT just on that? Um, if a program has that, does that little line, is that the deal breaker? Is that the vitamin that makes the program fantastic? No. Um, for example, use of chaining. Can I just go off task a little bit to maybe clarify what I'm rambling about? Chaining boards, chaining mats, you know, where we take graphing cards and have kids take out a graphing to make a new word that we dictate, change mat. Now can you make it change, make, change it to man? Now can you make it, and so forth. Um, has anyone ever studied the efficacy of ch chaining mats to determine if they are, you know, effective or not? No, but we do know that chaining mats and that type of thing were in RCT trials. I can name a bunch of those that I was involved in, and we had the kids use them as a tool. So I, I guess um, I hope I'm backing up and agreeing with what you said, Faith, because, you know, otherwise you did throw me too. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't really throw anybody. What I'm saying is, I think there's this no. impression 
that's being given, whether it's on social media or by certain, um, you know, marketers, influencers, I don't know, that if you get a particular program, then you're covered. And what I'm hearing you both say is no, that you really have to know, again, it goes back to teacher knowledge, you really have to know the difference between um, what you're going to choose with kids and what makes sense and what you should push to the side, as you said, your red flags. Exactly. Yeah. So, and I can, we, yeah. oh, go ahead, Carrie. I mean, it's been kind of enlightening having, because part of our process um, has actually been communicating with the publishers as well. Um, mm -hmm. We don't want this to be a gotcha. Um, nope. We want this to be informational. And so we um, trained highly expert teams who did a very deep dive into the curricula, but still it's possible that they missed things, right? Um, and so we were able to go back and forth with all of the publishers until we got to a place where, um, you know, everybody felt like the truth was on the paper. Um, and if not, the publisher still has a chance to respond. Um, and through those conversations, it's been enlightening. And um, it's also exciting because this work, um, they're listening. <laughs> yeah. So um, the publishers, some of them reached out and we still have publishers reaching out now for this upcoming year to be reviewed because it's, you know, it's like a free review against the research and they are shifting, you know? Yeah. So I think that that is an exciting part of this work as well as just having those conversations and seeing that this is where the field is pivoting um, and they're listening to the research. And that's a really exciting thing too. Yeah. I think that's true, Carrie, that the most exciting thing for me um, is that the publishers are eager for our reports. They feel safe and they understand everything we're going to do. We keep our word. There's no conflict of interest. We, you know, we do not, um, they can't pay us. We don't take a penny for this work. Um, so they, they're they eager for our review because, you know, where they get a number that's a little on the weak side, they can fix that. And how amazing is that going to be for pr the children who end up with a better curriculum or in the teachers? So, um, so I want, can I go back a smidgen to, we knew this was a heavy lift and, you know, the level of expertise it can take that might not be there right yet for, for a group. So we said, maybe we have to do what we never imagined we'd have to do and actually review the curricula ourselves. This was, you know, we have a lot going on. Did we really want to, but we, we felt we had no other choice. So we said, Hey, Carrie, what do you think? Should we do them ourselves? And she, I mean, amazing. I can't tell you. But so now talking about these guidelines and using the workbook, what we're about to release on May 1st on the Compass page, which I hope everyone's gone to, um, is a new segment on that Compass, which is the curriculum decision makers page on May 1st will be on there. And that's where the reports that we have completed will be featured. And I want to name that Faith mentioned, um, you know, that evidence aligned materials, it's not all you need. Um, it's also the mm -hmm. reason why, well, one of the many reasons why we built the Reading League Compass that was launched in October. Um, so if you haven't checked it out, it's all free, um, reliable resources, and it's bucketed by uh, uh, groups. So if you're an administrator, there's a page for you to understand that, yes, it's about evidence-aligned materials, but it's also about coaching and about building a multi-tiered system of supports and implementation and all of those important things. There's a page for understanding the science of reading um, and English learners and emergent bilingual students. There's a page for educator preparation programs with lots of great resources, uh, model syllabi, all sorts of good stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a page for educators um, with lots of great resources and a page for policymakers and state education agencies. I know we are hot in the middle of a legislative season right now. So if you haven't been there, check that out. And yes, as Maria mentioned, there's gonna be a brand new page for curriculum decision makers. I think there's a placeholder right now coming soon, so. Judy, I have some questions, but I wanna 
throw throw it to you first. Do you have anything that's pressing right now that you want to jump in and add or add? Yeah, so I was I was thinking, so there seems to be like a lot of great resources, right? Schools are kind of overwhelmed. Is there any way that you can create like a cheat sheet of like step one, step two, step three, go to this tool, touch that, you know, to make it really like easy? Because mm. now a lot of schools were thinking about September and what we could do maybe over the summer if we're supporting principals. And it would be nice to maybe have like a to-do list to navigate through everything in the right order and so forth. I don't know, just an idea. You can see this is what administrator page. What? You could start with the administrator page of the Reading League Compass. Okay, great. But I'm still gonna write that down as an idea because that's how we get ideas. Thank you, Judy. Or yeah, whoever said it. It's really exciting. But you know, it's just hard because a lot of A teachers are very overwhelmed right now. In the field, I've never seen teachers working as hard, but they also looked really stressed stressed out right now because there's so many new yeah. programs that they're using and you know everybody's thinking about how to budget their time how to get it right and then there's also the kids in the field there's still a lot of kids that aren't reading well so we all want to start september really strong and we also want to think about what could we do right now we have a couple of months of school left how do we get started that's a good question. What can people do just in the next couple of months at the end of school, um, working with what they have, right? So mm -hmm. moving forward, we could think of other things, but what about what people could be doing right now? You could use the guidelines as a roadmap uh, and just have a, a PLC and look through and determine whether within your materials, whether they're teacher developed or whether you have a, a packaged curriculum, whether it includes the components and have discussions and see how you might um, uh, supplement that. Does it also align to your data and what you're seeing, right? Um, do you notice that your data is low in a particular area? Um, and look at the guidelines and see what the research says and see if, if you could marry the two of those and and strengthen um, strengthen instruction. Well, I, and, can I just say one thing? I'm sorry, because this is important. Yes. For those people listening, what Carrie is saying depends on your assessment tool. Yes. Mm. So, mm -hmm. I would say make sure you have the right assessment tools to know what's working and not working because if you're assessing with um, assessments that are on the non-negotiables, this isn't going to work. <laughs> so you really have to know your assessments and what you have. Yeah, yeah. that's a hundred percent true. And I've even seen it in the field myself, not at my site, but I see um, some schools are claiming that they're shifting, but then they're still telling parents what level their student is at and, you know, where they landed on F and P. So yeah, that's something. Really so start Thank with you. the assessment section of the curriculum evaluation guidelines, because that'll lead those discussions too, which we do name that, um, that, that you may have to look outside of your instructional materials to, to look at your whole suite of assessments. But if you start there, that would be an excellent place. Yep. Yeah. So that's and another strength of our tool is that it has an assessment section. I think so, for mm -hmm. sure. Hey, can I just ask one more question? Yes. Of course. So, so we had Maureen Ruby on. She was an excellent guest for Sacred Heart. And she's the one that really pushed my thinking of really understanding the difference between a program versus a curriculum. Mm -hmm. Now, is this is what you developed something that's going to help schools get closer to having an actual curriculum with whatever program they're using? And do you recommend that this is something used by schools and also at the district level? Carrie. <laughs> um, I wasn't <laughs> privy to that conversation, so I would have to, I'd have to know more about the conversation, but um, <laughs> I think want to do the, the high level of the difference that you see between a program and curriculum? So I think what Maureen was saying, because you didn't mm -hmm. see the episode or, you know, I would highly recommend you do listen because Dr. Maureen Ruby and I worked together in reading first 
Mm-hmm. And so um, she was a dentist and then turned into teacher, administrator. She's from Connecticut. Leader. She's amazing. And I hope she's listening because I love Marvin Ruby. She's a personal friend and brilliant woman. But um, anyhow, Maureen was talking about how in Connecticut, because she works at Sacred Heart University, leading a major grant and program there. She's amazing. She talked about how it's important to talk about developing curriculum in terms of what are your needs. Yep. And then no program, as you said, is perfect. So then you could look at your program and see where the gaps are if you have a strong understanding of what curriculum should look like. I hope that clarifies it. Maybe yeah, because yeah, I think the up. honest truth is what whatever I'm seeing looks like it would really, really help schools go in that direction. So yeah. that's why like when I came home, I was just like so pumped. I didn't want to stop looking at it. I was like, <laughs> And, and the beautiful thing about what you guys created is it's so specific. It's so specific about, you know, you, you, you guys went through like every pillar plus more, you know, you covered language, you covered fluency, you covered phonics, you co- covered phonemic awareness. And I think what's beautiful about it is you guys are current with the research and evidence, right? We got some new research and evidence that came out about phonemic awareness. And I'm sure that, you know, as, more evidence comes on that this document is going to be a living and breathing document. It's a living and breathing document. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, it can change because we're going to know better and do better ourselves. Yeah. You know? Somebody named practice. We definitely yeah. name practice in there, but we don't name the types of practice, right? So that's something that could be um, added to in the future. And so now that I understand the conversation, <laughs> makes I would say yes, right? this would be a resource to help build a full curriculum. Um, One thing that we always worry about in our discussions is that when folks think the science of reading, they think just word recognition or they think Mm -hmm. just phonics, right? And as the National Science of Reading Project Director, y'all, no, okay, we can't do that. And so in the guidelines, we have the research for all of the strands of language comprehension. Um, Maybe we could add more for oral language. That's something that folks have brought to our attention. Um, uh, But we have to make sure that like we are all, we're holding the pencil in our hands, folks. (laughs) So um, if you're buying a program that's selling you on the science of reading and it says we're a phonics program and we're the science of reading, no, look at the curriculum evaluation guidelines. There is research on so much more. It cannot be about that. So that's a program. If you want a full curriculum that addresses all of language and literacy, um, then we need to make sure that we attend to all of these components and that they are also um, derived from the research. So, Maria, if you want Dr. Maureen Ruby's email, yeah. I will give it to you. Because, I, 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 um, please email me. I will I, call, I I will check, I'll reach out to her tomorrow. <laughs> reach out to Maureen because she would be yeah. a great person. Anyhow. Let's get on with this. So how is this tool different from Ed Reports, um, you know, Evidence for ESSA, uh, WWC, and Curriculum Insight Project? Yeah, so there's um, talk about that. Let's go to the next step now. So we're going to sh- we're shifting from the guidelines to, I believe, the, repo, the us using those guidelines on existing published programs. Curricula, where people are going to call it, right? So um, now we can talk about these, which are going to be unveiled on May 1st, May Day, at high noon Eastern time. And we thought that was a really easy to remember anniversary day for the launch. So Carrie, you can talk about how many there are. I see a lot of people asking for which ones, which of course we can't say just yet because what if something goes, you know, life is life, right? What, what if we want to like with, hold one back for a minute or something? So Carrie, you can talk about uh, that the next step. And, yeah. And, yeah. and how it's... Um similar or different from others. Um, So if you are interested in joining us, I don't have the capability of adding to the chat. Otherwise I would have been dropping links like 
nobody's business. Keep putting stuff in there. I'm copying and pasting and giving you credit. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's, that's great. Um, that's like my whole high school experience, right? Um, so um, if you just Google curriculum navigation report launch, um, we did have a, a press release come out about it. And so that should come up and it'll take you to a Zoom link to register. Um, we came up with a, a different idea for this. We're actually having a virtual ribbon cutting. So we have some folks that we have invited as ribbon cutters that will actually have a length of ribbon and some scissors and they'll cut it and a, a certain part of the website will go live. Um, uh, so that'll be really exciting. The question though was how is this different from other uh, reviews? And it is in that, I think what we named maybe before some folks were there, if you look at the guidelines, you look at the last half of it, um, it's the empirical research. It is um, you know, the scientifically based research meta analyses um, from which we are learning. Um, and that is what we and it's fact to fact, right? Um, it is the mm. fact of the research. And it is the fact of the materials. There's no room for opinions here. Um, it's here, it will have, it, for example, in what did I call it? Reading is awesome program, whatever it is. Um, on the teacher's <laughs> manual of reading is awesome. We noticed the following words and language. And so that's why we gave this particular thing a one or a two or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so it's fact to fact, so you know it will be reliable. Um, Ed Reports, I know, does reviews against the standards and um, and against usability, right? Um, and that's not what we're doing here. We are analyzing the materials for their alignment to the research. So it's a much deeper dive in that area because Ed Reports can only go so far as the standards will take them. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not very much. So you'll notice some of the all green curricula. And again, these are these are prior versions. They may have updated and, and gotten stronger in this area since then. But you'll notice on those prior versions for foundational skills, for example, they might have had an orange. That's a pretty scary area to have an orange <laughs> in, right? And yet they had so many other green indicators that overall this curriculum is green. So we're doing a deeper dive so that you can see directly how it aligns with handwriting and encoding and, um, you know, text structures and some of those things that may not have been uplifted in a more generalized standards review. And there are no other reports that are uplifting those practices that are not in alignment to the science. So interestingly enough, you mentioned some things that what we're hearing on social media has become controversial, like text structure and reading strategies. And I don't see how that is controversial. It blows my mind that that's controversial because there's so much research that backs <clears throat> um, reading strategies inferencing, mm -hmm. text structure, and you even have that in the guidelines. Mm -hmm. And I am thankful for that because you. if you look on social media, um, you wonder where people are getting this information from, yet they talk with such um, conviction mm -hmm. that they have the answers. And yet many of whom are not educators, they're not researchers, they're not professors. Um, you know, it's it's really um, crazy out there. And then if you question this, all of a sudden it's thrown back to you, oh, you're an anti-curriculum person. I swear, that's a term that's being used, anti-curriculum. And, you know, no, this has nothing to do with being anti-curriculum. This has to be, Right. And it has, mm -hmm. as Carrie said, you know, something that is aligned in every way with research. And then the other term, by the way, that I hear is being used if you question anything is, oh, um, you know, do it yourself. DIY. Do it. Oh, you believe in DIY. I don't know whoever said that. Um, but Judy and I haven't said that. As a matter of fact, Judy has said that's what she has seen and not that that is um, the best way to do it. I'm Judy, glad that I got out of that situation. I know you do it yourself. So. No way. No. So nobody is saying that teachers have to or should 
do it themselves. But that's what I'm seeing. It seems like anything, if you question anything that goes out there with people pushing certain programs, they either throw it back to you that you're anti-curriculum or you're in the do-it-yourself camp. Could both of you kind of talk a little bit about that in terms of what you're seeing and um, why do-it-yourself may or may not work? And are we really anti-curriculum if we are asking about the efficacy of a program? Could you talk about that? Well, we get, I, you know, you hear, I'm hearing everything you hear too. And um, because we have the stance of knowledge first, that appears as though we are um, anti-curriculum, but we are not, you know, we are, here working alongside in a trusting relationship and a very transparent, honest, forthright relationship with publishers who are respecting our process and are very impressed by our process. So um, Carrie can speak to a little bit about, you know, some of the interfacing with those curriculum programs. We want to um, work with them and support their work because they're needed. We need curriculum. I'm, I know we're talking programs. <laughs> yeah. um, sorry, I know that's so frustrating once you have a, a word you prefer. Uh, but, you know, it's it's not a, it's a yes and. Knowledge and programs. We have to have both. Yeah, and is it possible Ooh. for somebody to develop their own evidence-lined curriculum? It's possible. It's hard. Yeah hard. Yes. Teaching mm -hmm. is hard. Looking She's at the data is hard. You know, I mean, wiping noses and figuring out when you're going to bring your kids to the bathroom is hard. Like there's so many hard things. So absolutely. Like let's have a little bit of an ease by having a, a curriculum. Hopefully that was written by experts and not like celebrities or so legit celebricators, you know, educational educators. There's and gotta be two celebrities. Two celebrities. I love it. There it is. So um, so so let's make sure that it was written by actually like look at the authors, right? That's that's transparent information right there. Uh -huh. Um and who developed it. Um it's it's so helpful. When I taught, I mean, I taught social studies when I was in Austin, it was my first job. The first thing was like, hi, um, head of school, can I please buy a curriculum? Because that's gonna help me a lot figure this out, right? And especially when we're in a teacher shortage. Um, I know that there are a lot of folks that are against the more scripted curricula, but, you know, I heard from the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs about their success during Reading First, and it's because everybody got behind these, these um, more scripted curricula, and they had their paraprofessionals that were able to teach evidence-aligned materials, like, from day one, and the outcomes that they saw, like, you can't lie. So that's not me saying that, you know, I have an opinion one way or another, but I'm saying follow the evidence, right? What works, what's going to help your teachers, and of course, build knowledge so that you can implement those materials um, uh, to the to the best that your knowledge will take you with the help of your coach. <laughs> Judy, do and you want to go to some of the questions we have? Okay. Yeah, we have some good questions and comments. Here I go. Um, While she's looking too, oh, um, we, did, so we aren't in competition with other, you know, review programs. We aren't trying to outdo or getting, you know, so that's so not true I think either. Yeah. Address this. We, um, the report's going to look at specific programs with their name, one of the viewers asked. I think a lot of people want to know what programs are going to be revealed. I mean, we knew that question, so... Tune in May 1st. It's only a couple weeks away, folks. Yeah, not, okay. we're counting the hours now. Um, and we can say about how many we're going to release this year, next year. Let's see what else. Um, you guys can all cheer for me if there's seven that are released. Right now, we're definite that there's going to be six. But if any of y'all that are on the podcast, you see seven, then I need you to like give us like a little clapping. So just good vibes. And then um, next year, eight one more. hopefully um, being released within the next month or so and continued reports being released throughout 2024. So we have a comment from David and, or a question. Can you help us thin the bloating curriculum out there? There's just too much to cover. And will your help, will your tool help us with this overwhelming task? 
Yes, because you can look um, through it using the tool and saying, okay, where are non-negotiable things we have to cover? And where and if there's any red flags, we can just go X those out right now and just focus on the fluff, not the fluff. Then we had a comment from Lauren that said, there's, there are sales reps stalking parents who fight to prevent them from pushing their curriculum into a district. Any comments? Let's see what else. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren. Love you. Um, I think a lot of people I'm in trouble. That, I think a lot of people are on this podcast right now are definitely seeing that there's financial gains for some companies. And, you know, people seem to be much more diligent. I think that, you know, since we were all sold a story, right, we don't want to be sold another story. So mm -hmm. if you had to summarize in a tip, how can we all avoid being sold another story? Wow. Because what? I was sold <laughs> by, these other, by these other programs, right? So now let's make sure that we're not swinging the pendulum and know that the guidelines are steeped in the research and that research is a science of reading. Nothing else is a science of reading except for the research. So while this is not all of the research that has ever been conducted on reading, there's so much more. Um, this is pertinent research that we can uplift these consensuses, consensuses um, from and, um, and you know, use this resource um, as, as, as your navigator, right? Use the reports as your navigation reports and we're always open to, um, to feedback and suggestions of what the field needs. Yeah, we definitely have some comments. We have one viewer that said, is there any chance this could be released earlier than May 12th, May 1st, because they're very excited. Um, schools are adopting uh, in the adoption stage and they just want a little bit of help. Uh, can I make that person feel better or at least us yes, feel better? Do it. I by saying these were going to be released October, <laughs> we're already uh, racing against time. Um, but you know, we don't want to rush and do a job that's that we have to fix. We've, we've got to get it out right, and we need the extra few days. Sorry. Um, then there was a comment by somebody or a question. Kathy said, "Does it cover reading comprehension, including developmentally appropriate tasks by age and grade?" I definitely did see that there's reading comprehension in there, yeah. right? Any comments, questions? Yes, not no. to the detail of age and grade, um, but there's um, certainly a reading comprehension section. Yep. All right, I think that's it for right now. We can get back and then I'll look through and see what else is interesting. People are loving you guys, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I love, love that people are calling the compass while you are listening. Yeah, I love that because I call it my fourth child and it just makes me so happy. Please share the compass. Please share it with friends Please and share. everybody. Well, you know, we, these these resources are all free. Um, everything, the compass was developed. It's no chart, you know, no cost. The, the defining guide, it can be downloaded for free. There's a Spanish version of it and all of this stuff um, because... You know, I think everyone on this call are gracious hosts. We all know that adults need to get over their adult problems because there are children waiting for us to do that's that. Right. That's right. That's right. Um, so I I know we develop these for the practitioner, for the decision makers, for the important stakeholders who pay for curricula, who develop curricula, who um, mandate curricula, and um, how can how, how are we going to be able to ensure that as many systems can benefit from this work if we don't let them all know about it? So thank you to Faith and Judy and everyone here for anything you can do to help get the word out. We had one interesting comment, and I know I've heard this one from many people. Jane said, I sure wish that this had come out a year ago before my district spent millions of dollars. So... I know that a lot of these programs are right now um, going on legislations, right, Faith, on on state state. So how does that work? So if they don't get a great score, what does a school do? Do like people mm -hmm. are going to probably get a little nervous when when the results come out, right? What do they do? 
Do they have a, do they go drink a Starbucks coffee? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tim Hortons. <laughs> um, well, if you have a program, you know, that you already have or are po about to get and what, and one of the reports that gets released is on that program, you know, dig through it and look where there's a number that's a little bit, eh, and then guess what? Do something about it. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Work with what you have. Knowledge. Use your knowledge. That's what I want to just yeah. jump in and say. As I'm listening to this, mm -hmm. I think that what people should at least um, walk away with is whatever program they have and whatever program their district is going to buy doesn't mean they're doomed. No. If the district understands what is important and what they should get rid of. And so if there's anything that people are walking away with after tonight is that there are going to be really positive elements in everything they see. But that doesn't mean that you just toss it and move on. Some things are worth it if you could have if you could move away and you haven't bought something new. Mm -hmm. Obviously you try to do your best to align whatever program you're going to choose with what your documents are showing we should look for. But let's say it's a program that ends up it didn't get high scores based on your navigation reports. It doesn't mean that people should take this to their community school boards and start screaming and yelling, saying, look what they've done to us. They bought something that they should not have done because I could see that happening. The, the educators, the professionals need to be professional and they need to know what's going on and use these documents appropriately. I That's just right. wanted to throw that Another in. Another step to building. Maria, I'm going to give Faith a cheers. Yeah, 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 me too. Me too. <laughs> Can I, I just want to also name that my one concern, Faith, is that folks are going to do this and that is not the intent. It's not a witch hunt. Um, mm -hmm. These are the publishers that allowed us to peek under their hood. Can you imagine dating and being like, hi, um, can you first review me for red flags? Right? <laughs> That's scary. So I appreciate the publishers that allowed us to take their materials and look through it. It's a challenging process. And we will also name the curricula that we reached out to that declines to provide materials as well. So so let's make wow. sure that we know that this is um, this is a tool to build your knowledge and to just take a, a deep dive into your materials and your literacy practices. Very interesting. I had a question. So some schools in the field are doing like they'll use one program for their phonics, a different program for their ELA knowledge building. Did you guys look at like only knowledge building or did you also look at phonics programs and how people put them together. Some schools have Hegarty, some schools have Geode, some schools mm -hmm. have, you know, different things. Did you go over phonics programs or was this mostly like the knowledge building portions of programs? It's the comprehensive ones first. We're really looking at the comprehensive ones. So they include foundational skills and knowledge. Um, we do, hopefully we will have one report published on a Spanish um, foundational skills program, because there's not a lot of uh, organizations that are reviewing those. Um, and so that is the one that's the closest to kind of more foundational skills only. Um, and then also their sister program we're reviewing. Um, but other than that, it's the comprehensive tier one curricula. Yeah, because I know some schools are using like UFLI, foundations. So we're not going to see stuff about that. Right. We'll get there. Right. We'll get there. Okay. Okay, great. I think you both said that you can fill in the gaps with multiple resources. And so I guess if you first look at, you know, the core type of uh, program and then it doesn't have something that you need, then that's where you fill in based on need. Right. right? That's yeah. what you're looking at. 
yeah, and maybe the publisher has a solution within its suite, right? Because we're really looking uh, at the the tier one materials and not the ancillary materials. So in their response, they may name, oh, by the way, we have this fluency add on or we have this. And so it's also to show folks like and um, we're going to name on the landing page just because we've checked these as like not red flags. If you don't use this part of the program, then you're actually creating a red flag in your instruction. <laughs> so we're we're hoping that that the that that this is a roadmap for knowledge building um, across the board. And we're really hoping that administrators and decision makers don't just go on and pick one without reading the report. You know, like don't just go. I'm getting feedback. Is anyone else getting it? Okay. Maybe. Try it again. But we, we worry about um, the possibility that people will just go comb through these and look for look at the numbers instead of look at it, look at each program's report in consideration of what they already do, what they already know, what their students need, their schools, what their school needs, et cetera. So um, we don't, we didn't want to design this so it would be a, just a go find a certain color and buy that one. We don't want that to be the case. That's, we want some thought and, and um, deliberation put into these very important and expensive choices. Yeah, we had a great comment that relates to that from Trish. Oh. She said, she said, this will raise the bar on what publishers will produce. So mm -hmm. oh, we're already seeing that, Trish. You're right. Mm -hmm. Big time. It's really exciting. It's a nice side effect of all the work. Shocking, yeah. really. Shocking. Yeah. So um carrie maria did is there anything that you'd like to add that we did not ask or we didn't cover that you feel is important before we wrap up well i made a lot of notes and crossed them all out so i feel <laughs> like this was a lot and thank you for letting us you know give people the understanding of the difference between the defining guide the evaluation guidelines and then the upcoming navigation reports so thank you i would put out one more caution i think the only thing that i didn't mention is um we have seen some publishers that are completing their own um mm -hmm. guidelines and that's not the intent um you you know there's always going to be some level of bias um when when that happens. So this is not meant to be a marketing tool. It was built for educators and schools. I know it's ridiculous, but it's happening. Um, and I, need, I need to press the yes button. On that. <laughs> if, you know, if, if you are evaluating yourself, <laughs> that is. Okay. Everyone go like that. It's like, oh, <laughs> it's a good place to wrap up. Oh, my goodness. Judy, is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, somebody, I don't know who it is, but somebody just said that they were proud of you for pushing the BS button, Faith. So <laughs> to my wonderful co-host, um, will you guys be doing professional development for schools so that as we try to do this step by step, we can have somebody to hold our hands? <laughs> That that just started coming up as a question about a month ago. So we see that day coming of some, we have to think about that and see what the requests are like and um, remind people May 1st. Can you put in the links one more time, like where they can go to sign yeah, in? Yeah, so Carrie put it in and I'm gonna copy and paste it. Okay, May 1st, and then they will be on the Reading League Compass, the readingleague.org backslash compass. Well, at 1230 on May Day, because that's when we cut the ribbon and press the button, not the red button. <laughs> Hold on, I'm, I'm, I'm it. sorry, I won't even be around for that. Unfortunately. Oh, um, but um, Judy oh. will. And she'll she'll oh. let me know about that. Um, I'll be away for a couple of weeks at that time, but I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. Thank and you. I want to thank both of you because it's really exciting that uh, this was developed. As I said before, and anybody who came in late, I could recognize quality work and um, 
you know, after doing this for a long time. And Maria and Carrie and your whole team, I am super impressed with what I've seen and I know it's going to be successful. And I hope that people will, will go to you first, that this is going to be the go-to to determine what people should use and look for. And um, I'm, I was, I'm delighted that we had this pre-launch event with you because, um, you know, for us, Judy and I don't make a cent as podcasters. That's not our gig. Actually, our I, think we made, I think we made $3.25 today for an hour. Oh, ad. wow. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll put that to the fees that we pay for the podcast. So <laughs> and yeah, we know that um, this is done without also thinking about conflict of interest or a, and that is very important to us that we got your message out. So thank you. And thank you. good night, everyone. This is going. Good night, everybody. To Find us on our good website. Go. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Share this, share this, share this, the Literacy View Instagram, Apple Podcasts, we're everywhere. You know where to find us. And Yes. Till next time, changing lives one view at a time. Good. And our website is theliteracyview.com, theliteracyview.com. So you could get everything just from looking at the website. Okay. Thank you.